Welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. And I am Zach. And up next, we answer your questions about trail running, upping race distance, and down weeks. And after that, World of Running updates about an inspiring turnaround, some marathon history, and more. Glad to have you with us once again, and Merry Christmas, Happy Merry Christmas. Holidays. We're kind of like in the in between, the in between week when life seems to not be happening, or maybe too much of it's happening. Exactly. I guess it just depends More on the situation. More parties and work has like <laughs> resumed for many. Who so. knows? <laughs> Who knows? Well, all of that to be said, this is our favorite episode of the month. And it happens to fall at a wonderful time at that, but it's a Q&A episode. We're going to answer your questions, and in order to do that, we need your questions. So if you've missed your chance to, to submit them for this month, you may still do so for any month in the future as often as you would like to. And all you have to do to submit a question, go to adcrunning.com slash question and just ask us what uh, you're thinking about mm -hmm. with running stuff, training, nutrition, shoes and anything to do with running mm -hmm. and we may or may not have uh, an informative answer for you mm -hmm. thanks for connecting liz messaged me on instagram and she wrote thank you for this week's episode i became a frog eater late last year and it completely transformed my that's productivity gross, <laughs> that's gross you Don't... guys have to realize like what we're talking about by listening to last week's episode mm. and ensured that i also got my workouts in even during the most hectic of se life seasons this year I love that more people are now going to be familiarized with this quote. So if you're not, yeah. you can go back and listen to our episode about how to be a frog eater. <laughs> uh, how like to eat Liz. That frog. And it's great to hear that you have been Liz and it's been great to follow your journey as well and to see how you've been able to accomplish so much. So props to you on an amazing year, Liz. There are other breakfasts available to you, though, <laughs> other than frogs. Well, speaking of ways to be inspired and focused and determined, if you don't have a spring race on your calendar yet, you should put Rivertown Races on that calendar. It's in April. It's in West Michigan. It's a great event, and it's getting better all the time. For example, this year... <laughs> A to Z Running is partnering with Rivertown Races. You've heard us talking about it. We are the training provider for the event. And as such, make available to all participants um, a general training plan that anyone can follow. And if you would like to, there's a paid upgrade where we will write you a custom training plan as well. Mm -hmm. And that is a discounted custom training plan versus our normal rates for participants only if you're running Rivertown races. But you have to be signed up in order to do so. Right. And it just so happens the deal keeps getting sweeter because you can also <laughs> get 10% off your registration oh, wow. <laughs> if you use code A to Z. 10. That's A-T-O-Z 10. Mm -hmm. So to learn all the stuff you need to know about this event, go to rivertownraces.com and you can find the page there for our training stuff. If you're already registered or if you're not, sign up, use code A to Z 10 and then check out the training material so you can get a scoop on what's going on. Here's the thing. When you're signing up for races like this, if you're anything like us, you tend to wait a while. You don't sign up months and months in advance unless it's one of those that you have to plan like an entire trip for, um, which if that's the case here, you may already be signed up. But the point is to take full advantage of the experience, you do in fact want to sign up early. Otherwise, you don't have access to some of these sweet interactions we're describing. Yeah. And we're gonna be there. I don't know in we're what, like, there. in what capacity. Like Zach might run it. I might be at a tent. Like we don't know exactly what it will look like, but we'll be there. We will so, be there. Yeah, we'll we'll be visible, be so and fun. we're going to have some eighties running swag. And so, if you haven't been able to order some of your stuff from the website, you'll be able to pick it up, and you can purchase some there. Yeah. And now making promises that we haven't fully <laughs> planned out, but you know, it's going to be great. It'll be fun. So go regardless. to rivertownraces.com. And when you sign up, use code A to Z 10 to get 10% mm -hmm. off. Now on to our main topic. Well, it's Zach's favorite episode. It's not just my favorite. You always say that. <laughs> I, you I like, like this too. I do really enjoy answering the questions and stuff, but I think Andy also I, really I likes really interviews, like the interviews though. Yeah. And, and as you've noticed, if you've been following our podcast, Andy does almost 100% of the interviews. And that's a time thing. We're just splitting the duties and everything. But really, I, that, that it's geeks because me out, people so. won't 
talk to us if they have to talk to Zach. <laughs> that's not true. Because who wants? You guys any all of that? know that that's not true. But I, I enjoy all the episodes, and this episode is going to have some great questions from some of you. So thank you. Absolutely, that. So this first question here comes from Jeremy, and it's about running on trails. And he writes, "What are your thoughts on running easy efforts on trails? I usually spend about thirty percent of my time on running the grass and dirt, like on the shoulder of the road, anyway." And with trails specifically, I like the variation in terrain loosens up my ankles. Well, at face value, um, I think you've you've kind of given the reason for why it's uh, generally a good idea in your comment uh, in your question here, Jeremy. Yes, uh, it can loosen up your ankles. More generally, it uh, allows for a different degree of stimulation and mobilization mm -hmm. than just running on flat pavement. Um, and so any kind of off-road terrain has some potential value in that sense, um, among many other things that can be valuable. And we'll, we'll hedge that in a moment. But um, we often, you know, reflect on things like the softer surfaces, especially for newer runners. So if you've been running for 25 years, mostly on pavement all of your life, the pavement is not likely to cause you problems anymore. Um, it can still, but it's not likely to. But if you've only been running for the past few years and you're finding that your joints get sore after and when you start increasing training, things like that, if you have some shin splints types of problems, although there's a lot of other reasons why that may be the case, but this, the hard surfaces of pavement can be a part of the problem. So softer surfaces help alleviate that. Yeah. Trails among them. And the fact that they're varied, like uh, you've mentioned, the ankles being more mobilized, but also if you think of vehicles i tend to do that because that's my other job is uh, talking about the auto industry yes adaptive variable suspension so what that, know, is, what that is is that your vehicle can actually um it can adapt the suspension for the road conditions and it can do it like in milliseconds but your body is actually even faster than that so depending on your terrain you can stiffen or soften how you're going to land depending on your terrain. And it's really good for you near muscularly to be able to have this skill. So it's developing more in you than just it just one facet, but it actually helps you become a better runner. So there's there's a lot of conversation around this concept of like ground contact awareness. That's where the whole barefoot running industry actually kind of really started to explode was when people started looking at um, what happens physiologically when there's a higher level of neurological experience with ground contact. So like when you're more aware of the ground contact, you seem to actually, your body moves a little differently um, among other things. Now I am not a proponent for barefoot running on most circumstances. Uh, however, the point made is a valuable one. And so as, as we increase variability and terrain it helps allow for some changes in yeah. the way we're doing things well, and just even different different push off angles mm -hmm. and having to you know like uh, soften your step because the the terrain is not going to be exactly even you're not going to like launch powerfully off of that it can help you in your cadence which we uh, talked uh, about recently we and we have a question fact, about it doesn't... but it can help you remember to keep your cadence light and quick and yeah. so there's just a lot of things about trail running and we're Varying terrain, I think, is really the main point is having a variety of different terrain that we run on mm -hmm. can can help us overall do better as a runner. Yeah. So now to answer the question very directly here, uh, Jeremy's asking about, like, what about my easy efforts on trails? Um, and therein lies the the key crux of the question. What kinds of things are you doing on variable terrain and how much time are you spending on that kind of stuff? So what if I'm doing this like once or twice a week and it's when I'm just running easy? Um in general, you just avoid extremes when you're doing this kind of stuff. Whatever the uncommon thing is, avoid extremes for that thing. So, for example, if you run rarely on a treadmill, don't jump on a treadmill and run for two and a half hours and run hard. You know, things like that. A lot of people are like, I just did that last yeah, week in right. the snowstorm. Because you had to. Um, and we <laughs> yeah. get that. But, but again, still avoid extremes when doing something that is not as familiar physiologically. So run your easy efforts on the trails. That's great, Jeremy. Um, if you want to get to doing things like your long runs on trails or some harder efforts, uh, particularly, I really like doing fart licks in like mountain bike trails that are like r really technical um, because that it helps get the spirit of the fart lick even more natural. Anyway, That's point also is, kind of a risk. So. <laughs> it can be. So you have to work your way up to that yeah. if you're going to do something of that nature. Don't just start right away. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
Well, like thanks that for that question. question. That's mm-hmm. a good one. Now, if it's <laughs> if it's winter time, um, then you have to change all of the rules because you know everything's different. Like if you're running on ice and snow regularly, uh, it's good to get on some more flat ground here yeah. and there to give yourself a break. <laughs> so right. anyway, like getting on, the, I had to get on the treadmill because I was doing so much. Too much on the uneven. Running. Yeah. <laughs> so then you need to get on something that's flat and consistent to give yourself a break from the other. Yeah. Okay. Well. Good question there. All right. Now, this next one comes from Bill, who was the one who commented. We shared his comment uh, related to the Cadence episode, but his comment included a question. And so we wanted to address that question specifically here because it's a very precise one. Yeah, we love that. Thanks, Bill. So Bill's been working with a PT. And uh, this physical therapist talks a lot about uh, cadence and in the effort to address cadence specifically brings up the point of, and I'm going to read here, muscle and tendon elasticity and how higher cadence releases elasticity to prevent injuries like one he had previously faced. So Bill writes, if I lose my focus on cadence and don't keep it in the higher range, do I lose the advantage as well of muscle tendon elasticity and make myself more prone to injury. So we had said, if you recall, um, and Todd Buckingham said on the interview that there seems to be an, an overemphasis on finding the perfect cadence yeah, at times. Exactly. 180. Um, and so that's what Bill is referring to here where he says, okay, so if I'm taking that to heart, then the point here is I probably shouldn't try to coerce my cadence to a stringent metric, which is exactly the point there. Um, and so if I don't, do I lose some of the potential advantage that his physical therapist was discussing about muscle and tendon elasticity? So that's uh, that's a really interesting question, yeah. Bill. Um, and we can only answer it insofar as our understandings of these things can address it. Um, neither of us are going to claim to be uh, foot and ankle specialists right now as we share these thoughts. However, I'll refer to a few specific things that are good sources of information on the topic. One is a study that a friend of mine was a part of years ago. Cool. And the reason why I'm bringing this one up is because – uh, they they spent a lot of time trying to find a result that didn't happen. And here's what it was. So this was an elite group of athletes that they studied. It was like 20 of them or so. Um, and they were trying to specifically look at the, uh, the value of reducing ground contact time while you're running. So they'd put them on treadmills so that they could set a fixed pace, right, a fixed speed, and then have an athlete run normally, naturally, and then have that same athlete run um, by specifically thinking about just getting off the ground faster. So it's just shorter ground contact time. Naturally, cadence has to be higher for shorter ground contact time, but the speed is the same. So they're not changing pace at all. They're just changing the amount of time their foot is on the ground. Okay. Now, that being the case, what might we find? So they did They did find two things in general. Um, the one was that it seemed to be the case that there was some kind of correlation between lower ground contact time and efficiency. They thought that there was some kind of correlation there. But what they found is that when they tried to have an athlete increase their cadence a, or decrease their ground contact time, it did not result in increases in value or benefit. Instead, actually it had the opposite effect where it was causing greater stress or strain or fatigue for the athlete. And that's no surprise because it was an unnatural running mechanic that they were trying to coerce. So they didn't, they didn't, the problem here is they didn't do a longitudinal study and like mm-hmm. have interventions where they like, you know, did drills for three months and then had the same athlete, you know, now is your ground contact time lower naturally, you know, things like that. They didn't do that. But instead what they said is if an athlete runs outside of what was kind of felt like their natural cadence, it creates higher strain on them. So then we add in a layer here where we say, okay, so think about Jay DeSherry's work then on the topic. And he's the author of Running Rewired, which is the source of this present comment. Um, he specifically talks about how the thing that makes the benefit in a, in a mechanical change for someone is when that mechanical change becomes autonomic, becomes a natural mm-hmm. thing. It's not a benefit until that happens. As a matter of fact, it's kind of a detriment most of the time. So whatever thing I want to improve about my running mechanic, it only truly becomes an improvement for me when it's my new normal state. So you have to do the things that help create that new normal state. And almost all of them, according to Jay DeSherry, 
are not the things you're doing while you're running and trying to like think about your run running mechanic. It's the things you're doing outside of running with drills, activation, exercises, coordination, stability, all that kind of stuff. So if we start so, to piece that kind of yeah, thing yeah. together, we arrive at this point of is there increased muscle and tendon elasticity in higher cadence? Um, one of the things that happens when your cadence is higher is that you tend to strike the ground more beneath your body. And so your foot spring action tends to be higher because if you land more on your heel, it reduces the spring action of your foot and ankle, right? So that's, that's where you hear a lot of people decrying the heel strike. You got to get rid of the heel strike. Um, so we add that layer into things and we say, okay, yes, it's true. There's a higher elasticity effect if my ground contact is in a different place, which is correlated with cadence. But once again, it's not causal to, to simply suggest that faster cadence means I have better muscle tendon elasticity is not necessarily a guarantee. It's also not the way we achieve the desired result. So first, in this case, Bill, you got to try to achieve the desired result through the work you're doing that produces that mechanical change in a natural mm -hmm. state. And when you do that, those benefits that this PT is describing of the elasticity, they will be able to come with it. But if you try to coerce it from the other angle, you're likely to result in greater degrees of discomfort, potential injury, because you're stressing your system. You're stressing it outside of its natural mechanical state. And then also keeping in mind that it very rarely produces long-term um, change. Right. And there are some clues that you can give yourself while you're running that will help you, though. So, like, a lot of the work is done outside of the run itself, but having clues that help you get back to the correct mechanics. Like if you think light and quick, like you don't have an actual 180 that you're looking to shoot for, but if you think you're starting to feel lethargic, you're in, you're maybe you're doing an increased effort and you're starting to get tired to think light and quick will help you get into better mechanics to then achieve your goal. But I do think we have talked a lot about getting negative feedback on your runs or feeling badly if you're not hitting something exactly like a pace or maybe it's a cadence. So having that feedback might not be helpful if you're not hitting it the way that you want to be hitting it, but instead reframing it and thinking something like light and quick to help you have a more positive internal dialogue about the topic. Yeah. And, and as Andy's making a Hodge reference here, coach Hodgkinson, um, one of the things that he mentioned to me, one of the first times I had ever talked to him about this stuff before all of our A to Z running inter interactions with him, um, is he said, oh, everyone always wants to start with things like cadence, but usually the thing that's causing your poor cadence is something other than just cadence. You know, it has something to do with like, you know, the position of your hips or your collapsed torso or, you know, all these other things. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it's it tends to be that the problem is somewhere else. And if all you're trying to do is in increase your cadence, you never solve the problem. Hmm. So that, that was okay. insightful too. Yeah, good. This okay. This is such a fun conversation. I know. It's a good one. I'm, I'm glad that Bill brought that to us. Yeah, and what a great question because it, this is what we always talk about is like, you know, the questions um, add as much detail as is pertinent, as is relevant because uh, the the focus here helped direct the question towards something yeah. even more. And now remember that this was, these were all, this was a conversation based on our episode with Dr. Todd Buckingham about cadence. So um, I'll make sure that that's linked yeah, to maybe this good episode to, as well. <laughs> yeah. Go back and listen to that for, for further reflection um, mm -hmm. and a little bit more of the science from the guy who studies the stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, this last question, is it the last question? No, we got two more. <laughs> this, this question is from Kristen. And um, in particular is one that we have not actually had a lot of people ask, which has surprised me. And I'll tell you why it surprised me here in a little bit. Uh, but Christ Kristen was asking about um, our approach to training cycle stuff. And specifically, she said, um, I have a question about down weeks. Is this something that you implement once you get into actual marathon training? Um, or how do you usually incorporate this into a training plan. And I thought, oh, that's a great question because we don't. And it know, isn't. It's, but and it's actually recommended by quite a few very smart people. So we have to discuss. Yes. We have now. To discuss why, discuss <laughs> what the philosophies are. And first of all, I want to say down weeks will happen in our training with our athletes because. Will happen for any athlete, period. Right. Unless you are 
a machine of uncanny. <laughs> But you have precision. no hiccups. Everything always <laughs> Life goes smoothly, never changes and you always well, get perfect sleep. <laughs> but no, let's let's keep in mind though, because many of you, and I know this because many of you have said this directly to us. Um, there, there's certainly a, an approach to training that suggests I am willing to do whatever it takes to hit the plan every day, no matter what, and you'll get through an entire season having done that. And so, yes, some of you listening will never have a hiccup in terms of like you'll do everything that's on the paper by itself that can or cannot be an asset or a liability. Um, but that's not the question here. The question is, do we do down weeks? And, and no, we don't. And why not then as, as a result? Um, okay. So it, like Andy said, you know, it's an important reflection on like, why do people recommend these in general? Because it's, it's probably one of the most common, if you talk about like, what are the most common things that you see as general recommendations in running training? Uh, a cyclical down week, and usually it's between three to five weeks, three to five weeks of regular training, and then a down week. Um, you see that everywhere. Now, one of the interesting things I find is that if you start looking up um, why should I take down weeks, one of the one of the reasons most people give is that most people say to take down weeks. So the reason yeah. is because this is what people say to do. Um, well, I find I have, that interesting. Yeah, and the other thing that that people will say is that you need to be able to have the rest for the adaptations. But the thing is, is if you're pushing yourself so hard that you're not recovering, you shouldn't wait weeks until you're able to take the recovery that you need. Yeah. So we would like to see someone be able to move uh, and be strong enough to continue to do week on week without having a deficit that they need to recover from. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if there's two holes that will punch in this generalization argument here, the first is that your training adaptations shouldn't need extra rest to be optimized. That's actually kind of a little bit silly because it suggests now this is usually not true, by the way, but it suggests that you are training too hard for those three or four weeks to be able to continue that training without a down week. Well, if that's true, then train a little less hard so then you don't need the down week and you can you know just keep keep it going um there's there's an idea out there that says that that down week actually increases your training adaptations well that's not true if you look at the data on how you know, how training adaptations are occurring in an in an eight week period of time someone who trains a little less aggressively for those eight weeks and is consistent and someone who trains more aggressively for three with a down week and then more aggressively for three with a down week their adaptations are negligibly different. It, it, if not, have nothing to do with the difference in that training. You know, there's other factors here. But the point being, by the science, it's kind of silly to say that, to suggest that that is a better way to yield adaptations because it simply is not. However, that tends to be, um, you get you get the point of what people will say because you need a down week in order to be to rest a little bit more, right? So that's that's the 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 general comment that they give in that situation. However, if that's true, then the point of you need has to begin with do you need a down week at that time? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is possibly, but not necessarily, because now we're talking an individual situation. Why is it that in general they say you should train for three weeks and take a down week? Well, you should train until you need a down week and then take it down. Week. So now once again, it doesn't make sense to structure a training plan on the premise of you're going to need this rest at this time. Now there are certain ways you can, of course, do that. Um, point being, we go back to our first hole, which is the most, the biggest hole that we punch in that argument. And that is simply that if, if we're talking about the goal of a, achieving training adaptations, um, it is not necessarily more effective to do that and the concern about injuries which is another one that people will say uh, well you, you reduce risk of injury with those down weeks yes that's true but you should be reducing risk of injury by training in a way that you can sustain without injury so that goes back to individual intuition individual, yeah. and if you do in fact need a down week you're gonna take it you should take it but that's not a planned intervention in a training structure that's an intervention based on need and so no we don't we don't 
suggest planning down weeks in your training. We suggest taking down weeks if you as need them, you, as when you need, you need them. them. <laughs> and as they happen in your yeah. life, because and a uh, lot of people are going to have to, it's going to be like a day. For instance, many of you guys are coming off the holidays. Maybe like for me, my long run was shorter than it typically is based on our schedule. Well, that's like a down week. So, but it, it happened mm-hmm. in my schedule naturally and it, they're going to happen. So down weeks will happen, but structuring them Again, also, like yes. saying, it needs to be more customized. Uh, also, to that point, Kristen, on principle, um, the idea of a down week, and for some reason we need all seven of those days to be influenced, because they'll say things like, you know, take a 15% cut for a week. Um, well, if I need more rest to achieve better adaptations, why does it have to be a 15% decline for seven days? Why can't it just be like two days light and then I go back to normal training or three days light? And then I go back to normal training. Like, it's just kind of weird that we just arbitrarily assign every three weeks, take a seven day, 15% cut. That and doesn't I, work. And for I think me. that there are some people though, there are some training methods where they'll have like uh, a week where it is lighter for like mental reasons as well. So it's like a down week because of just the stress of, of life and everything like that. So, but that's why we think that it's good to take it when you need it rather than having it be written in a plan. Yeah. So as it goes, if there's one thing that is most true about how to train at our most optimal state, it is insofar as your training responds to your need and situation and it is premised on based off of your goals. And if your training is not doing that, if it has these arbitrarily structured things, which by the way, all training has to have some amount of arbitrary structure um, in, in future thought because you don't know what next week is going to be like, but you have to plan what next week might be like. Right. So that's 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 kind of the same idea here. You could have a training plan with built in down weeks if you want to. But don't just assume you're going to take them all on the exact schedule. Instead, do the thing that you need based on when and and how you need it. Okay, so that that, that's our roundabout answer to essentially say, no, we don't. (laughs) Um, But that's not because we don't ever. It's because we don't plan them. We use them as needed. Okay. Question from RJ. This is our last question here uh, for this month's episode. Um, And I can appreciate uh, that this one is highly nuanced and very individual. So I'm going to answer RJ directly in his situation, um, and then we'll try to kind of give you some general considerations for everyone. But the question here is RJ is doing um, his first ultra marathon in March. And if you're listening to this in December when we're recording in March, um, and he is doing a 50 mile race. This is his first ultra marathon. Um, actually, I'm not sure that he's running even a full marathon yet. He's running a full marathon. He's we've we've got all the details. So he's running a full marathon in January, and then his first ultra in March, and it's a 50 miler, right? So, point being, his question then is, how impractical is it if I bump up my race distance? I'm running. My first 50 miler in March, and I'm curious about bumping it up to a 100 miler instead. Okay. I love the ambition. Well, yeah. And, and, and this and is how ultra marathoners are. In fact, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so how long can I go? It's, ne- it's never about like what sounds, you know, what what should I do? It's like how much can I do? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, it's, it's a great mentality. All right. So RJ, in your situation, this is your first ultra marathon or at least certainly your first 50 mile plus race. Uh, you've never done anything longer than that and you're considering doubling the distance. So the first comment we have to make here directly to you is it's probably a bad idea. <laughs> in this situation, it's probably a bad idea for one simple reason is because you have not had the time to sustain adaptations that will help you be successful at that long of a race. And we know these types of adaptations, musculoskeletal type of resilience and structural strength, that kind of stuff builds very slowly and takes long periods of time to really grow substantial, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that and we know that going from I've never run 50 miles to I'm going to run 100 miles instead is probably too big a leap in this situation, especially because you're asking this in December when the race is in March. Okay, so that's that's my very specific immediate answer is Mm -hmm. I would not do that. Um, Not to suggest that you couldn't do it. (laughs) Never tell an ultra marathoner what they can't do. Exactly. I'm not saying you couldn't do it. As a matter of fact, you probably could and it probably could go fairly well. Um, 
but you shouldn't in this situation. <laughs> Our, if you're going to ask for a recommendation. <laughs> you, right. You should. Well, you're asking, so I'm giving yeah. the answer. Um, you shouldn't in this situation, probably. Yeah. And it goes back to then simply just the case of we we are always more likely to recommend incremental progress over time. Mm -hmm. uh, most things in terms of running are better addressed as what's the next step and take that step before the next leap. So the next incremental step is do the 50 miler mm -hmm. because you've never done that before. And maybe six months later, maybe a year later, mm -hmm. you can do the 100 miler. Yeah. And some things to consider for ultra marathoning is that you do have to learn how it will go for you for sleep, what you will wear, what you will eat. There are just a lot of factors. It's like going on a journey. I mean, it literally is, it go literally is going Most of the time, you're journey. covering a lot of terrain. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. Yep. So there's a lot to, to consider. And I think that a lot of the races can help prepare. We've had athletes where it's like, wow, I learned in this race about micro naps. Mm -hmm. I learned in this race about what I need to bring with me so that I can sleep a little bit during this hundred mile race. Cause there's just so many more factors when it's a multi-day event. Yeah. And it is true to say, because others have told us this, neither of us have experienced this, but, um, you'll hear, you'll hear someone say, and if you are an ultra marathoner, you're going to probably nod along with this. Um, running a 50 miler is nothing like running a hundred miler. So you can say, well, this was my experience at a 50 miler. That doesn't mean that your hundred miler experience is going to be anything like that. And su such is case when you go from a hundred miler to a 200 miler, you know, that kind of thing. And the point is not that if you run a 50 miler, then you know what a hundred miler is going to be like. It's if you can do this step, then you have a better chance of being successful at the next step. Because well, you learn stuff. You learn stuff, but also you're just giving yourself time to yeah. experience it and adjust and adapt to it as well as the physiological adaptations. So um, going for then a general appeal here, when you're trying to increase things like race distance over time. So let's say you've never run a half marathon before. You're thinking about, should I run a half? Should I run a full? Um, once again, a half marathon and a full marathon are two very different experiences. Um, but we still recommend take the first step first before the giant leap. And that all comes back to give yourself time to, to adjust and adapt so that you can be as successful as possible at that next step. And one of the most important things to always remember about long distance running when we're talking that kind of thing is that it's not so much whether you can survive the thing, it's whether you can get past it on the other side in the best state possible. Mm -hmm. Because that's what's going to, these adaptations are going to make the biggest difference on, well, the late stages and the moments after, mm -hmm. moments being days, weeks, possibly. That's well, exciting. I think that ultra marathoning is really cool. And, do you? Uh, I do. Okay. All right. <laughs> and, uh, and I wish RJ all the best. Absolutely that. Well, that wraps up our questions here. But just remember, as always, if you have questions, we're going to answer them at the end of every month. And we're going to do so if you ask them, well, anyway, that you can get a hold of us. You can ask the question anywhere that you can find a way to contact us. But the easiest way is probably just go to a dizzyrunning.com slash question. Now let's get on to the world of running. First on the docket for the world of running updates here, a really interesting story. Uh, stumbled upon this one on Let's Run, uh, but the original source then, we tracked it back to the, the original publisher, it was Austin American Statesman, which is uh, news, uh, news out of Austin, Texas. Um, and so this local runner in Austin it has kind of risen to some amount of the running scene awareness because of an incredible life turnaround story. And we just want to share this mm. here really, really briefly with you. Love stories like this. These are, these are just so inspiring. Um, so the first thing is now we're talking about we're at the end of 2022 um, at about 33 years old. Mitch Ammons, Ammons um, had run uh, freshman year of high school. And it was reasonably, actually, he ran like a 450 mile as a freshman in high school. Uh, that's good stuff. Certainly a way faster than I was as a freshman. <laughs> um, and so Mitch was uh, a high school runner with some amount of potential promise who, by his own words, um, he stopped running, by the way, r after that freshman year. Why? He uh, quote quoted in uh, the Austin American Statesman saying, that's when drugs kicked in. I was hanging out with the wrong crowd and started 
a drug habit that became a drug addiction that spiraled into some pretty nasty stuff. And so Ammons uh, goes now years without any kind of physical <laughs> sports athletic activity. He's not doing any of that kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, very unhealthy. Six visits to rehab um, that were unsuccessful and just relapsing. And he's, he writes about it in the article here a bit more. But just a really dark time for him. And so you now bring yourself to about age 26. So this is about 10 years, plus or minus a little. Um, and in 2015, really finally found the um, well, the, the life change turned into then he was able to find Create sobriety. New habits. Yep, he was able to find sobriety. Now, in finding sobriety, he was still dealing with some unhealthy stuff. He says, like, I was smoking a lot, like cigarettes at that point, but also, um, eating a lot of junk food, living a very unhealthy life, and was not enjoying the unhealthy state. Now, enjoying the sobriety, but not the unhealthy state and just feeling like the need for something more, right? So he starts picking up some running and just a little bit of kind of some casual stuff at first. And then in 2018, he joins kind of like the local running club and found he really did enjoy it. So a year later, decides he really wants to take this thing seriously. It's about a year later. And so around 2019, starts like training for seriousness finds a coach, you know, he's like getting into it, right? Later on in 2019, ends up running 107 and change wow. in a half marathon at Grandma's. Many of you are familiar with Grandma's Marathon. So he runs 107 and change at the half marathon. Very respectable time. At this point, it's like, well, that's unexpected and shows promise. And now we're talking, you know, 29 years old or so and really starting to see like there's some there's something here. And his coach is like, you know, you've got some potential, really believing in him at this point. Um, and I, I like the quote in the article. He basically is writing that, like, one of the things that was obvious from the start working with Amons is that he was able to suffer, could just really could hurt and could get through it. Uh, so 2019, that's good. But two years later at Chicago Marathon, he ends up running 223 to finish 24th in a World Marathon Majors. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And then later on in that same year, runs 106 and a half. And then a few months later, again, runs 105 and change in a half. And it turns out in that half marathon when he runs 105, he ends up finding out that he has appendicitis going on. <laughs> Didn't quite realize why he was uncomfortable until he had his appendix removed a couple days later. So what? 105 and change in a half marathon when he's dealing with appendicitis is, is no joke. At that point, his coach is like, you've got this thing, man. You could run the Olympic trials qualifying standard. Now that's Now we're talking like... This this is changing levels here. We're we're really into something cool. So 2022, he ran that 105 and change half at the beginning of the year, and at the end of the year, in this uh, just earlier this month, at the California International Marathon, ran 216 and change to enter one of the top uh, top hundred marathon times by an American in the last three years. So. Wow. Right, last two years, sorry, when the window, whenever the window opened, um, and and officially qualifying for the U.S. Olympic Trials Marathon. Awesome! That's so that's so cool. That's, what that a story! Was, yeah. So after seven years, uh, seven years after getting sober, uh, kicking a nasty drug habit, all the worst ones out there, um, he ends up qualifying for the Olympic so Trials cool. and the marathon. Love what a, what a just an impressive! That just takes something else. Yep, discipline. Yeah. Among other Desire things. Desire for life change. <laughs> That's awesome. Very cool. So congrats, Mitch, on congrats, that Mitch. and looking forward to hearing mm -hmm. how that trials race mm -hmm. goes, too. Well, we love storytelling, and so we're going to continue on that thread. But a little history for you. It's a story of Durando Petrie and the 1908 Olympic oh, Marathon. I love the early 1900s. Yeah. And a lot of this is written by Roger Robinson. So I'm taking a lot of it from his his storytelling, which is a true story. <laughs> Published uh, by Athletics Weekly. Mm -hmm. So this is London 114 years ago at the Olympic Games. And this was the marathon event. And there were crowds watching Durando Petrie. And there were some great quotes that I wanted to pull out of what Roger Robinson said. He ended up quoting someone who was there. He has gone to the extreme of human endurance. It is horrible and yet fascinating. This struggle between a set purpose and utterly exhausted frame. They're talking about. 
Petrie at the end of his race. Oh, man. Set and it had already been <laughs> a very volatile race. Like, the British, who were supposed to be some of the favorites to win, had, like, gone out really fast. And we're fading by mile 10. So it was, <laughs> like, really little, early. That's a little early. <laughs> exactly. There was a lot of that going on, apparently. There were a few names that were listed in and when they faded all before like mile 16 or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Before mankind really invested himself in discovering how to train for the marathon, the things that happened in these marathon races were just incredible. <laughs> yeah. Well, so this is what it happened. Like with Durando, Durando, now we know it's heat exhaustion, but they didn't really know at that time. But people were like so fascinated by it. They thought it was crazy. The crowds did. He collapsed four times. So he's like oh, laying no. on his back That's and they kept good. like helping him up. And <laughs> Come yeah. on, man. Get yeah. back to it. <laughs> and it got really exciting because then the second place guy was like coming up and he's from the U.S. But people helped this guy across the finish line helped Petrie across the him along, yeah because that's They're allowed holding <laughs> him up well that's the story that's the story <laughs> of it because he did end up crossing the line first with a lot of help but then the guy from the USA Johnny Hayes he ended up finishing and actually a strong race he was able to run a very um it, this is what the quote was a quote perfectly judged race <laughs> when everyone else was going bananas <laughs> oh is it, is it are these all <laughs> quotes from her. arthur conan doyle what no this is from roger robinson i think all right all right yeah um but conan doyle was the one who wrote the um yeah. That he has gone through extreme human endurance. Anyway, so going back to the story, so so he crossed second, and so then the U.S. team put in a petition because. Well, I mean, you can't Petrie get was helped. helped yeah. But before this time, this is what set the precedent for that rule that they can't have assistance that an athlete. Oh, can't that's has, where that rule. Yes, began. that's where it began. Uh, so we all know this is this was from the article. Now we all know that if you give assistance, the runner must be disqualified. But we we know that now because of what happened in london that day all right there you go mm -hmm. so what happened after that petrie and hayes were offered to race marathons for big prize money indoors 262 so, so it, laps because people were so enthralled by their suffering oh man they just wanted to watch them <laughs> they wanted hurt? to watch them hurt yeah so marathon mania was spectacular american show business that is awesome <laughs> why not anymore I don't I know. know I don't know. Maybe we're maybe. too composed. Maybe, maybe we're not doing. Look, doesn't look painful we enough. We don't have enough. Well, I'll tell you right now. And... If that's the way you're running your marathons, you're running them wrong. Exactly. Most likely. Well, so. we learned better, I guess, <laughs> yeah. so that it's not quite as as not crazy. As much of a spectacle. Oh, bananas. I yeah, liked bananas, that word. Yeah. People well, everyone going else bananas. is going bananas. Well, these days going bananas sometimes is a good thing too. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's an exciting story. So we've yeah, we've fun. linked to the original article by Athletics Weekly. You definitely want to check it out if you want to read more <laughs> all right speaking of athletics weekly this one's a really interesting article posted mm -hmm. recently so once again uh link back to them if you want to read the full thing but in in a, just a quick summary here uh the the discussion was on women's menstruation and performance mm -hmm. and it came up largely because this this instance at least um after the summer uh world championships there's a lot of conversation about um women had said at different points in time that they felt like their performances were hindered from different points in their menstruation. And so uh, maybe we should be studying this a little bit more. Yeah. Maybe we should have a better understanding. Well, we've been talking about it quite a bit. We have. And and there are certainly people out there who are trying to study it more because, in fact, there really is not a lot of decisive data um, on – on what exactly is going on and how we could potentially n know what to do better. In and the reason for that is, well, ultimately what it boils down to is um, the individual variability is so high that it has become very difficult for researchers to make generalizable claims about women's menstruation. And so why is that surprising? You know, that's not of course. Um, but it's, what's interesting is that it, the variability is seems to be higher even with something like this than with other things like nutrition or something or certain kinds of training stimulus. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, well, it's not, again, that's not terribly surprising because hormones are another thing that we respond to 
all of us humans in very, very different ways, one to another. Yeah. Um, and so that's the biggest concern here is that when they have, and so then there, there were a number of points in the article, they started talking with some endocrinologists and uh, exercise physiologists about this stuff. And they're like, okay, so what can we know about these things? What has been studied well? And the point, a couple of points actually were interesting. One was um, one of the researchers said, well, one of the challenges here is that we have studied this fairly extensively, uh, but not at the like high performance elite level. And well, why not? Well, because elite runners don't want us to study them. <laughs> like they, they won't do it when we ask them. Um, not at least in the large they quantities. Gotta give them that you some money then. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, uh, they probably do anyway, but um, so that's one of the obstacles they have faced, which is they just haven't had a lot of study candidates, not compared to what they would like to. Um, but also what it comes down to is this researcher in particular quoted in the article said, well, we've, we did a meta analysis recently. We took uh, 78 studies. I think it was um, with over 1200 different participants. And we're trying to then basically say, okay, based on methodology, because whenever you do a meta analysis, you have to compare like methodology, because if you don't, it, the, you can't make similar claims from different studies, even if they study the same thing. So methodology being like, what kinds of things did they do to collect the data? Um, what kinds of things did they do in terms of like control groups and variables? And so one of the concerns raised was, well, some of the times, some of the studies were collecting data from like uh, just perception uh, metrics. And so people just report on how they feel on something. And they said, well, as it happens, and you might guess this, most women, when they are having their period, report feeling worse. Okay. Well, no, no surprise. Apparently that is something yeah. Andy has to tell you better than I do. Yeah. Um, but the point is, is they said, but in fact, they would plug someone into some things and say, okay, this person based on our performance measurements that we're doing here looks like they're the same as when we measured them at a different stage. Right. And yet they say, I feel worse, but performance wise, you aren't indicating that you're feeling worse. Like your heart rate's not different. Your, your respiration's not different. Almost, your muscle different fatigue, better, muscle actually. firing. Yeah. So that's what they started to find as they said, okay, there is a uh, one nearly generalizable claim in terms of menstruation and performance. And that is that during the, what's it called? Um, Luteal? no, no, no. It starts with an F. What's that cycle? It's right before the period starts. Um, and follicular? then the, uh, yes, follicular. Uh, stage. And so during that stage, there seems to be a consistent possibility of a slight decline in performance potential. Um, and they can measure this in small ways that, that tend to prove, produce a consistency like uh, maximum muscle contraction, right? So how much can you exert power uh, can be slightly different, right? But as they have found in so far as they have studied it, that even then that decline is almost negligible so statistically insignificant and is still not consistent amongst all participants and so that brings back the individual variability thing mm -hmm. whereas Andy noted some people do experience a decline some a significant decline but others experience performance improvements during that stage mm -hmm. so that raises the concern of you want us to be able to make some general claims that we, that we can then respond to but at the same time if we do that, we're potentially harming people because they're trying to make a change, a behavioral change, a nutritional change, something like that, based off of someone else's data. Mm -hmm. You can only, and this is what the researcher said here, you should only be making those kinds of adjustments based off your own data. So here are her recommendations, and these were great yeah. recommendations. She, she said, first, you need to learn how your body responds to the different stages of your cycle. And if you have not been tracking and paying close attention to that kind of stuff, but you want to be trying to optimize, you know, what should I be doing at different times? You need to start paying closer attention and mm -hmm. tracking it all. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also need to learn in general. So what kinds of things affect this type of stuff? And then how do I respond to it? So if I make a nutritional change, this is one of the ones that comes up a lot um, because different stages in your menstrual cycle, you process fats and proteins in different ways, possibly. That's not, again, it's not always true for every woman. Um, However, if that's the case, you should know it. And so you should start paying attention to what kinds of things can influence and then how does it affect me? And then I have to do a little bit of almost kind of some trial and error and find out what helps me feel better in these different stages or how does my body respond to some of these things and take you know someone else's data with a grain of salt. It's informative, but that doesn't mean that it's prescriptive. 
right. of what you should do. And of course, you, you've heard us say it, and we'll say it over and over, that the best way to really figure out what you need is to pay attention to what your body's telling you. But then also, you know, your perception can also that can be wrong. Like we're saying, like if you're fatigued or there's you're not feeling great, but your performance is still doing well to look at those um, pieces of data as well in order to figure out what those those things might be that you want to to look at and change. Indeed that. So the final comment uh, that we'll raise here is the uh, the researcher in the article specifically um mentioned that there are a lot of like resources out there that claim to be um, basically like adaptive services that can change your training. She was talking specifically about running now that can train you based off of your stages in your cycle. Um, And she said, be careful about that because almost all of them are not based off of your data in any kind of true sense or thorough sense. Um, They're just simply going to say, you'll tell the system where you are in your cycle, and it will make a very general training recommendation that, once again, is based off of, well, in in her comment, it's not really based off of any science. Yeah, and what we've told our athletes, our female athletes, is that we want them to pay attention, and if they need, like if they need um, to have a day be an easier day that was supposed to be a workout day based on how they're feeling, then we're going to make that change. But that's not just for menstruation. That's for all things. So if someone feels like they're going to come down with the flu or, you know, there's all kinds of things, it's more of an individual basis than it would be a general recommendation. Yeah. And that's and you and, and you really if you if you're trying to optimize, you got to do that work of finding out how do I feel at different points in time. And once once again, now, while we say that there's a lot of individual variability, there's a lot of variability within individuals, too. Um, and so that's another thing that obfuscates the results here. But point being, learn some of this stuff for yourself, because you can start saying things like, you know, in some instances, at different stages in the menstrual cycle, it's better to do easier, longer aerobic things and or at other stages better to do shorter, intense things. But when that is true is not always at the same stages for different women as well. So you got, yeah, as Andy said, (laughs) we have to know based off how we're feeling right now, what we should be doing for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that is not an easy thing to do. But when we grow in that capacity, which of course brings us back to our original point in all these things, when we become more intuitive as runners, we can best address our needs in a way that helps us achieve our goals. So how's that for our world of running? (laughs) That was, that (laughs) That was was a world of of running with a lot of extra topic, general recommendation. (laughs) Yeah. But you know, as it goes that sometimes it is simply unavoidable to talk about the things that matter most in terms of our training efforts. And uh, so we we did a little bit of that, but you know, you heard us make a lot of general comments here. And so if, in this moment you find yourself thinking well those are good thoughts in general but you just said that we should only take general recommendations with a grain of salt of course you're right so what you should be doing instead is heading to adzrunning.com slash coaching and taking a look at our service options where we can support you directly either with a coaching plan and work with you for a year or if you just want us to write a custom training plan we're glad to do that or if you just want a conversation even we've got an option for just a quick consultation where we can talk through your situation and try to help you out there too and all told if you just aren't sure and you want to just ask us questions send us an email go to adzrunning.com slash question our email form is right there and we would love to help you out that way too we love it thanks so much for joining us and we'll talk to you next week